welcome back to day two of the 2020 Project Place Summit. As we develop our Reimagining School Sports in America project, we want to be mindful of the populations that are underrepresented in high school sports, among them students with a disability, youth from lower income areas, girls, and particularly girls of color. Even students who grow into their bodies late can get left out. So we asked a few athletes and former athletes if they wouldn't mind sharing their ideas on how to make room for students from those populations. Among those athletes was Olympic champion gymnast, Lori Hernandez. You know, Latinas are among the most underrepresented populations in sports, really at all levels, youth, high school, college, Olympic, and the professional level. You broke through. How do we get and keep more of them in the game? I, I'm a big believer in representation and what that can do for others. And I think when you don't see yourself on screen, whether that's uh, in movies and film, because that matters very much so, um, or especially in sports, I think it causes a lot of us to doubt ourselves and wonder if we can do it because there's nobody who looks like us. And so thankfully, my parents were just super supportive um, and making sure that I didn't see that as a barrier. And I think I caught on. I, I didn't notice anybody who looked like me, but I, I didn't see it as like, ah, no. So that means it's never going to happen. I was like, okay, we're just going to have to do something different. That's how it is. And uh, I was okay with that. And because of my parents, because of the way I was raised and, and being uh, determined to get there, I think that played a really big role into me kind of heading to the Olympics and, and being able to be that representation for those kids that are watching. And I'm hoping that with that kind of representation and representation in other sports and across other platforms, we get to get other kids who are like, ah, oh, okay, they did it. That means I can too. Because I think it really, at the end of the day, it starts with you, but environment also matters. Um, gymnastics is a very expensive sport. So especially if you're living in an environment where um, financially it's not something you can handle, then you can't even start it in the first place. So being able to make it easily or more readily acceptable for um, more families, I think is really important. Yep. How did you get into sports and, and why? So my whole family is a sports family. My mom did, I think it was volleyball and aerobics and just a bunch of other stuff. My dad did baseball. My brother did baseball and track. My sister's a black belt in karate and then me a professional gymnast. So uh, being active really runs in the family. My, I think my, my parents really wanted all of us to be active and to be moving in sports. And I had originally started out in ballet when I was three. They told me that if I paid attention well, that they would give me a sugar cookie at the end of the workout. So I stayed for two more years. And then I saw two athletes that I just thought they looked incredible. Two gymnasts on the balance beam. And I remember pointing to the screen and telling my mom, like, I want to be just like those girls. And she said, okay. And that's how I got started. <laughs> wow. So sugar cookies, that's the key. <laughs> that's the key. Cookies are the key to my heart. I mean, <laughs> you need anything. Just give me a cookie and it's all yours. <laughs> Right. So what did you enjoy about sports and gymnastics initially? There are a lot of things that I really enjoyed, especially growing up. I think making new friends was super huge, especially because I started homeschooling in third grade. And so having teammates who were in that same situation that I was, where we're all in the same environment for a really long time together and getting to just connect with them and, and have people who are in the same you know, good situation, but situation that I was in was very helpful. Uh, I, another one was just in sport, you know, of course, when you're a kid, learning how to be disciplined and, and how to pay attention and be respectful, all those things can be really tough because that's, that's how we learn. <laughs> but gymnastics has taught me a lot of those things. And I think the biggest part, especially just for me, is feeling so empowered and doing things that um, a lot of people maybe just don't want to touch or get near. I think the challenge is just so much fun. I can't help but get my hands on it. Yeah. Now you're from a family that's obviously very athletic and active. How common was it where you grew up for other Latinas to play sports and have ambitions in, in doing things in sports? Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I was in a neighborhood that was pretty diverse. I didn't, 
I didn't notice representation, but I didn't see anyone shutting it down. So it didn't feel like a barrier. Whereas I know that in many environments, you know, you don't, a lot of diversity isn't common, whether that's um, in different states, but in the city that I was in, in Old Bridge, it was pretty diverse. And there are a lot of th different things that um, me and my siblings had to kind of grow through together, I think, especially with all three of us looking just a little different. We could all pass as triplets, but if you really look, you know, like I'm, I mean, I'm full on just Boricua, I'm full on Puerto Rican, and, and so are my siblings, but my brother with uh, his eyes are bright green, his hair is very curly, he has a lot of facial hair, he's tall, um, he looks Middle Eastern, so it's like he can get stopped at different places that maybe me and my sister wouldn't, and my sister has kind of the palest skin of all three of us, so um, with that being said, it's like all our, our experiences uh, inside of sport and outside have been pretty different. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you think we see more young girls uh, who are Hispanic playing uh, sports? What are the barriers that come to mind for you? I think a lot of it has to do with environment and just like I know, especially going through puberty in gymnastics and watching my body change, um, being able to have the proper sportswear and the proper attire and the proper things to make sure that I'm still safe while I'm doing everything that I'm doing. Um, all of that can really add up and can get very expensive and especially in a sport where change is very difficult to deal with, especially when you get used to doing something over and over again. If one little thing changes, then the whole thing changes. So uh, gymnastics is a sport where when kids hit about 12, 13, or when they start going through puberty, that's a time where a lot of athletes will start dropping out and not just for gymnastics, but for most sports. And um, making sure that you have the proper encouragement to stick with it and that you are financially, you know, kind of capable to stick in there. I think a lot of those are factors that we need to really look into and to make sure that we're keeping an eye out and making it all inclusive for everybody to um, have an incentive to stay. Well, do you have any advice for schools, meaning administrators, PE teachers, coaches, on how to get more Latinas playing sports in school settings? I think encouragement is really important because just because maybe I didn't notice it as a barrier doesn't mean that other kids don't. Um, I, I do consider my situation to be pretty lucky and, and kind of like a nature versus nurture type of thing. Um, you know, if you see kids that are maybe shy because they speak two languages and they're still kind of getting used to, especially the young ones who are still adjusting to a new environment, encourage them and, and talk to them and try to get to know them because especially, you know, Hispanic culture is just making sure that there's family and there's trust and there's love all around. And, and it's, you know, when that's kind of ingrained in you, making friends can seem a little bit scary because you're looking for those things but like at such a young age, you know? So being able to connect with people, having encouragement, hey, you know what, I think this would be great. You should try it. And, and keeping that encouragement going. And not just for young Latino kids, but also young black kids, making sure that they're not excluded because um, that's a form of, <laughs> that's a subtle form of racism of, of not making sure that all kids are included and that we're only reaching out to certain kids that we think can excel without giving everybody a shot. Yeah. Now you're obviously a very good dancer. You won, you won Dancing with the Stars. Congratulations. Um, what about dancing uh, as a high school sport? Is that an opportunity to maybe engage more girls? Absolutely. I think dance is, is a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful way to connect. It was always a way for me and my family to get together, but especially as a competitive sport, I um, have family friends who had done dance throughout high school and just, they, they loved it. I don't believe it was through a high school class, but they had taken it just on, on the outside and fell in love with movement. If it was a rough day, they were able to take it out on their own movements and, I, I think it's something that should definitely be implemented and make sure that everybody at least gets a, a chance to try it, you know, a chance at everything. They might as well dip your toe in the water. So dance is wonderful. I'm a, I'm a big <laughs> outspe outspoken person on, on getting everybody to get moving, especially in a, in a rhythmic way. Right. I mean, and, you know, Dancing with the Stars is sort of can probably engage your competitive juices, right? Maybe a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Week one, I was like, so we're winning, right? <laughs> 
Well, you obviously yeah. nailed it. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> me? Competitive? No way. No. <laughs> Never. Uh, were you competitive really since you were a little kid or did that develop over time? I'm going to go ahead and say it was since I was a little kid. I mean, I'm sure it had to do with being the youngest of three, um, seeing my siblings do something. And there's, you know, kind of that whole joke of like, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was our little. <laughs> so I'd watch them do things and I was like, ah, I can do that. And then like would kind of just go and do it. Um, <laughs> It was, yeah, I'd say I was very competitive since I was a kid. If we did board games, um, I had to be taught how to not be a sore loser because I just, you know, wanted to sneak my way in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, kind of goes in that pattern of representation. Even my older siblings were people that I looked up to and I watched do things. And I was like, oh, okay, they do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it better because competitive. Um, but, you know, to kids who are only kids, that representation may not exist for them. Right. So maybe I'm asking this question to the wrong person, but what, how do you make room for girls who maybe aren't that competitive or boys? I mean, some kids just aren't wired in the same way that you are. Any ideas? Yeah, just make it a safe space for everybody. Because at the end of the day, also, everybody's different. I mean, and everybody is constantly changing. Some days I'm really competitive and I'm usually very competitive with myself, especially being a little older now. I I'm like, okay, everybody does everything. I'm just trying to be out, beat out my last score. But um, making sure that it's a safe place for everyone to be themselves. And whether that's being really competitive or that's just wanting to be better at what you do, better at your sport. I think all of those things are very important to take into consideration and that we're not putting them on the sidelines just because their intentions are different and we're giving everybody a shot. Gotcha. Uh, well, thank you for your uh, insights. They're terrific. And uh, we'll, hear, we'll, we'll talk to you more later about some of your other thoughts on topics at the Project Play Summit. So, Crystal, with, with so few role models in the game at the highest level who are uh, Black, um, who did you look to for inspiration? Oh, that's such a great question because I, growing up, didn't have a lot of role models who were black, you know, who looked like me, who, you know, had the same skin color as me. I think Serena Williams was that person. She was that inspiration that made me feel like, you know, I want to, I want to be dominant in a sport. I want to reach new highs and, and really break down barriers. And I think what I remember most from really watching Serena was seeing all the backlash that people gave her for how she looked, how strong she was. And I remember I kind of got that growing up too. I was, you know, really built from a young age and I was doing a lot of pull-ups more than the boys were when I was growing up. So I definitely got uh, made fun of, but in a kind of fun way, I would say, but it still did hit, hit close to me um, because I felt like, okay, so being strong is like not feminine. Like, what does that mean? And I think, Serena is someone who really um, put strength on the map for women and really made people feel like, you know, we're dominant. Women can dominate, dominate their sports. And it's important that you don't let anyone limit you or tell you that you don't belong in a sport or just, you know, you belong because you choose to be in that sport. And I think that was really incredible. And, and that's what really motivated me to stay in soccer and, and really try to reach new highs. Why do you think girls, and in particular girls of color, are underrepresented in school sports? Um, yeah, I think, you know, women of color face a lot of challenges that a lot of people don't know about. Um, I think in the black community, there are not as much encouraging um, opportunities for parents to give their kids. And unfortunately, a lot of kids that I remember going to high school with and middle school with had other responsibilities that normal kids didn't have, such as watching their younger siblings or maybe even having a job after, after school. So I do think there are challenges in the black community that people don't know about. So we really would have to first tackle those um, issues and then be able to introduce sports and encourage kids to uh, play any sport of their choosing and really stay with it. Yeah, so I was the only black girl on my team. I was quite used to that. I was usually either the only black girl on a team or in my classroom. So I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. Uh, my parents moved me to Rockwell Center, New York, 
from Jamaica, Queens, and they wanted to give my brother and I the, a better opportunity um, to have a backyard, get a better education. And it was actually then that I got into soccer because I was made aware of this sport. And I think that I would not have had that opportunity if I stayed in, in Queens. Mm -hmm. How did you process being one of the few girls of color on the team? Or the only one? Yeah, I mean, I think it was my new norm to be the only black girl on a team. I definitely didn't face any discrimination. I had a very healthy relationship with all of my teammates. So that was really great. Um, but that doesn't mean that I didn't think about me being different or looking different and questioning why that was the case. So it was quite lonely at times. But again, like I said, I did have a healthy relationship with my teammates. So that definitely helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And did it concern you at all that um, in predominantly black communities that, that the, you know, those girls were not playing soccer as, as much as they were where you lived? Yes, um, a lot of my friends who were black actually didn't even know I played soccer until high school. Um, it was when I was walking through the halls with my jerseys, they were like, Crystal, you play, you play soccer? What, what is this, you know? So it was actually really cool that I was able to introduce this sport to a lot of my black friends that didn't know a lot about it. But I do think that there is a lost opportunity in getting um, black players, black females, especially in soccer, because they just don't know about it. You know, in usually in inner cities where there's a lot of minority communities, um, they grow up watching football, basketball, culturally popular sports. And I think soccer just hasn't made that their way, that way to that neighborhood. And that's why you see a miss, an underrepresentation, I should say, of uh, minorities in the sport of soccer. Mm -hmm. And what are we losing, Crystal, do you think, by not making room for or working harder to get more girls of color in the game and in, and in sports in general? I mean, what, what, what's the argument for why schools should make this a priority moving forward? I think there are two arguments and two answers uh, to that question. I think, for starters, the first argument I would say is just minorities are losing the opportunity to really learn these fundamental skills, you know, just ha learning how to be involved with the team, how to, you know, continuously work hard, even if you failed, um, and how to actually deal with multitasking. Uh, for me, high school sports actually allowed me to multitask and prepared me for my college career. Just knowing how to balance both school and a sport was something that challenged me, but definitely made me better for it. And I think uh, minorities are missing out on that opportunity to really um, get all these fundamental skills that they could learn through sports. And I think the second argument is just, you know, players that may be talented are missing the opportunity to reach their potential uh, just by not being able to sustain and stay in the sport due to the financial burden that may be the issue or, you know, transportation, not being able to get to and from training sessions, I think has created a major challenge in uh, minority neighborhoods. How can schools make sports more accessible to girls of color? Any ideas? Is it a matter of like keeping costs down? Is it, you know, more proactive recruitment of, of girls onto those teams? What's the key here? Yeah, I think there are so many ideas. Of course, I think a lot of them relate to the money. It all comes down to the amount of money pouring into programs and what they can do to help minimize the cost for players. But I think, you know, high schools can really um, help out with club, local club teams by offering those fields. You know, I think um, when I was growing up, we had to play, pay all these fees for gear, for uh, travel, training kits, and mostly fields. So I think high schools, for the most part, can uh, figure out a way to kind of partner with local club teams and allow those fields to be utilized by those clubs so that um, it'll at least lower the cost on, on that issue. What else can be done to make this sport attractive to girls of color? Any ideas? Um, I feel like I have an idea, but it's kind of one of those scenarios of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. And I think we need to get more uh, women of color playing soccer at an elite level where they are televised, they're promoted. And that way, youth, the youth uh, players can strive to want to be staying in the sport even longer and, and reach new highs because they see someone who looks like them reaching the same dream that they may have. Um, so I think 
It's unfortunate because there aren't that many of us at the highest level. So we don't really get, uh, you know, put on TV a lot or people just really can't see that black women actually do play the sport. And I think it is really important for people to see themselves in their role models. What do you hope your legacy will be, Crystal? I think when I am done playing soccer, I of course want to be remembered as a great player, uh, of course, you know, but I think what really matters to me most is being a good teammate, someone who uh, really tries to lift up the mood in training sessions and, you know, just being a good friend. I think it's, it's really important that throughout life you try to impact lives and you don't try to just put yourself out there and, and be you know, first everything or the best at everything. It's about bringing everybody up along with you. So I would hope that players that I've played with feel that I've tried my best to do that for them. And um, I know my teammates always push me to be at my best and I, I hope that I do that for them. Well, terrific. Well, Crystal, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Jeffrey, well, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you, um, You know, we just launched phase two of Project Play reimagining school sports in America, which aims to identify models that help schools develop as many students as possible through sports. You know, the data show that most kids don't play school sports. Why is it important for schools to provide opportunities for all students? Well, Tom, I honestly believe um, sports is a whole person development tool. You need sports to grow. Um, to deprive any child of the positive life lessons that playing sports provides because of race, gender, or affordability is absolutely insane. Athlet athletics just builds character. I can say that from as a father, son, brother, friend. It's, it's a melting pot of kids that's trying to move in the right direction. So for that opportunity to be taken away from anyone, that does not bode well for our future. How does the coach bring out the voice of the kid as well? How do they create the communication so it's all not just one way and the coach saying, this, this is my way or the highway? Well, just appreciating who that kid is, taking the time out and, and watching him and learning him. It's a relationship. Ask them how the day is going. Ask them how school is going. How are they doing in the hallway? Paying attention to them when they do see them off the field. Let them know that they mean something to them. To me, that's what is so important about creating that dynamic between coach and player where you, that player understands that that coach has the last word, but that coach has to be open to hear what that kid is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and know, know that kid's story. It's actually one of the in our calls for coaches uh, package. It's, it's one of those calls and, and know what the kid's facing, know what they're, they're up against in life. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I look back on that notion. I had a math teacher, Mr. Pendle, a white gentleman, older. He took the time. He took the time to make sure that I understood how important it was to work in that classroom and how important it was for me to do the, give that same effort out there on that field. Mm -hmm. But when I saw him in the hallway, I saw him in the lunchroom, he went out of his way to, to touch me, to talk to me, make sure he watched who I was hanging out with. He, he, it, it became something um, um, within him. He didn't have to do that. I had a father, I had a, a two parent household. I had super parental supervision. Um, but unfortunately, that time is a little bit different than now. I had friends who only had one parent, whether it was the grandparent, whether it's the aunt, whether it's the mother, whether it's the father, and it's tough. So as a coach, I implore these coaches to take that time. And I'm not asking that you have to become a father and you have to provide resources, but pay attention. Pay attention because that kid is trusting that, that coach to do more than just the X and O's. I mean, baseball takes a lot of land. Basketball, not so much, right? It's a, it's a more affordable game. It doesn't require as much upkeep. How much of, of getting, you know, lower income kids or, uh, and, and, and kids from black communities into the game has to do with simply 
creating spaces that are nearby, not a half a county away, where they can play against other kids who are good. One thing that I do remember growing up was if you had a tennis ball and you had a wiffle ball bat, a wiffle ball, you didn't need a lot of space. If you had a stoop, you had a step, you had a wall, you had a piece of chalk, you had a rock, you can draw a strike zone. You can find a way to play baseball. Unfortunately, now you don't see those spray painted boxes on walls anymore. You don't see free access to fields. You see chain link fields. You understand that the growth, the, the profit that has been generated through youth and travel sports, the, the placations, they're putting a lot of money onto these fields and the maintenance of these fields is not for the public to go practice and just have fun on. It has to be remained to a certain level of standards. So they lock the gates. So even if I wanted to go out there and hit ground balls and churn up the infield, you're probably going to have to jump that fence and walk through the gate because they're protecting their investment. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you have to pay 10 to 15 or $25 to just go out there and play or you're being pushed off the field because you don't have any parental supervision or you didn't sign up with on the website to say, this is my block of time. We're reducing the kids for just going out there and organically playing. I went by a tennis court the other day. You got a net, you got a square and you got a, and you have space tennis only. What? That was one of the best places to play a wiffle ball game. You had a fence. You just had to jog it a little bit, but you had a net. Ground balls into the net was an out. Balls over the fence was a home run. But that was the game, but that's not happening now. Unfortunately, to your point, Parks and Recs, we need them. We need Parks and Recs to understand that there is a need to have kids out there, have more free clinics, provide equipment, provide equipment, provide gloves. Because when we went out there, I didn't have a personalized helmet. I didn't have a personalized bat. I, the coach walked in with the duffel bag and had dumped it out there and free for all. Oh, hey, hey, hey. And you left the bat there or you changed the helmet. I understand the COVID has changed a lot. But the affordability and how we're predicting or dictating how we should go out there and just play has changed. And so I just want these kids to understand. I want the parents to understand. I want the coaches to understand. This game is the hardest game to play. You don't have to be the most athletic to play this game, but it's the hardest game to play. So repetition is key. So the more chances we have a chance to get these kids out there in a free or low cost environment, and that's gonna take effort, that's gonna take time, that's gonna take patience, it's going to be better served for the game. So, uh, first of all, welcome to the, uh, the Project Play 2024 group. Uh, you're the first uh, players union that's uh, been part of our deliberations. Real excited to kind of dig in with you and uh, the other groups uh, sitting around that table to figure out how to get and keep kids playing sports in this country. What did, would you say the role of, uh, of the Players Association is? When you look at your assets, you've got your players, you've got your experience, you've got your you got some programs in place right now. But what's the role of the union? Well, Tom, first and foremost, I do want to give a shout out to, the, uh, to, the, to, to my staff, my colleagues, led by Tony Clark, who, as you know, has been widely broadcast that he's a former ball player, mm -hmm. former all-star. Um, he feels it's though that the Major League Baseball Players Association's voice, the players' voices is needed in this in these efforts. We're watching a lot of movement. We're watching what MLB is doing. We're watching what what Aspen and and, 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 and and countless other initiatives around the country that's trying to help move that needle for the better. Because we see that there's something wrong here. So Tony feels as though that, you know what, guys, we can talk about it all we want in this room amongst ourselves and we have the solutions. Now we have to, under, we're a union, there's strength in numbers, there's power in unity. Jess, how, how did you get into sports and even more importantly, why? What was it about sports that helped develop you? I think sports for me when I was growing up was always um, an outlet, to be honest. Um, not only was it an outlet 
um, for kind of between, I don't know, my, before my preteens, it was kind of a, a place where I knew um, I could just, I don't know, express myself a little bit. Um, and then as I grew up through my teenage years, obviously, you know, going through some emotional stuff myself, it was definitely my, my outlet from, from life. Um, so it was through the years that it kind of changed as the reasons as to why it was my outlet, but the one kind of, um, you know, kind of constant was that it was exactly that. It was my safe place. You know, I didn't feel all that comfortable at school at that time. Um, I didn't really enjoy going to school. I didn't feel that comfortable in my life because I was gay and it was really not a very common thing or it certainly wasn't a common public thing back then. Um, but one thing that was my constant and my kind of safe place was this club that was there for me every week. Um, and I could go there and, and be who I was and, and not have to worry about anything. But yeah, football was my love and I just, I couldn't do it at school. I couldn't do anything. We had to do gym and dancing and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, back, back then it was just not a very um, progressive time, shall we say. Right. And so what was it about your club environment and perhaps the coaches that made yeah. it a welcoming place for you? I think, well, number one, I think they kind of could see at a very young age that I had talent, um, which, you know, was important. But I think more, more important than that was, I think they knew that I, was, I struggled outside of, outside of club. And so um, I think they knew that if they had, they had to make sure that I enjoyed it there, so I would stay there. And then I guess in time they'd hope that if I kept enjoying there and kept going there, I would stay out of trouble. Um, I would feel more confident within myself, um, have more belief in myself, and then channel my talent to um, be able to achieve what I've achieved. So you're from the UK, but you played in the US. You have a sense of what our sport culture is like over here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a good chunk of our sport development or our participation opportunities are through the schools. And we're trying to think very intentionally about how to make more room for certain underrepresented populations in school sports, right? So what would be your advice for coaches or administrators to help make high school sports a welcoming place for kids who are LGBTQ? Um... That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think in a way to make it more open, I think it's important that the, the coaches understand when they're dealing with the age group of, of high school specifically, is that the actual game itself is probably the least important thing of your role and of your, your job. You know, obviously everybody wants to win and everybody wants to be that coach that goes 10-0-0. I think that's how the Americans say it. Um, <laughs> but truly the most important thing is that you take the time to um, understand your athletes as, as humans, you know, and as people. And you take the time to develop them and make sure they're okay and make sure it's a safe place. Um, and you do all that, you know, prior to the football or the baseball or the softball, sorry, or the, you know, American football or the basketball, because at that age, I think that's the most important thing. I really, really do. Because the sport, if, if the kids are talented, that will just, that will come that will that will come anyway you know but what 
will be a problem will be how they they think how they behave their self-confidence how they interact that will keep being a problem throughout their career if you don't help guide that at that young age and i think sometimes especially in america um that gets lost because winning is far more important than anything else you know if you just go there and you just play football and you just play the best players or you just focus on that you don't focus on the the group um then you're going to lose that you're going to lose that and if that's all you're focused on then yeah you're not looking at is so and so participating why don't they speak to so and so why are they not actively kind of um engaging in in team team activities and, and things like that sometimes we just can go oh yeah but she's shy or yeah but you know that's just him he's just like that he's, he's awkward and you know that's the easy thing to say you know the difficult thing to say is well what why are they shy you know it could be because for a number of reasons they don't feel safe they don't feel included you know um it's the easiest thing in the world to just put it down to something like that and put a kid in a box even even now i'll tell you a story that we have a new coach from from the rain and he came in for pre-season and this is at, at our level now and I'm, I'm 33 believe it or not i'm 33 <laughs> and um you know one of the first meetings we had we went into a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation and he just went how are you like how's your family do you miss home what are your feelings it was absolutely nothing to do with football not one thing and already we've engaged in a conversation that allows me to feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more kind of comfortable um, and a little bit more open. And that was our first meeting. It takes 10 minutes, you know? And I think we, you know, life is so busy nowadays and, you know, you have so much to do that we forget that those five, 10 minutes actually could tell you an awful lot about one of your kids and i think the most important thing to remember and i keep saying it is that you know we're not talking about elite athletes at this age at this point you know you're talking about young 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 kids and and young adults you could say um and yeah of course they're they're going to be motivated to become elite but in order to also kind of strive for that motivation you need to want to go to training and if you feel safe and comfortable with your coach which then makes you a little bit more open which means then you'll actively participate in group activities and with your peers then i think you're going to unlock more from that athlete than you would if you just solely kept pushing them to become elite but be completely closed off well, that's terrific well jess Thank you for your time. These were terrific insights. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, high school sports are dominated by the best athletes who, you know, as Michael was talking earlier, often start playing their sport at a very early age. They have the family resources to support early training and travel. And, you know, that can be hard on late bloomers. I mean, kids who start their sport later, like you did, or grow into their bodies later than other students. Yeah. Why should coaches make room for late bloomers in their program. Make the case for me. Um, look at look how I turned out. I mean, I think there's a non number of success stories. Um, if you think about it and you look at it in a in a different different term or a different form, look at a look at look at the makeup of uh, the National Football League or some of the professional sports. It's not always the guys that are drafted, you know, the, it's not always the top picks. It's always that the guys that are being overlooked uh, under under uh, evaluated um, that go to small schools. Um, those are the guys, they like said cream rises to the top. So um, if that's not enough motivation in itself, then I don't know what is. What responsibility do you think schools have to making sports available to kids who are maybe average or even below average athletes? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great responsibility. I think, you know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to crush a kid's dreams or aspirations or what have you by, you know, limiting their abilities or their opportunities to, to play um, with some of the elite athletes in their minds at that whatever uh, age group or uh, level of play um, that they're participating in. Um, you know, like I said, you can, like I said, that can lead into to other issues, depression, um, all types of things um, to where a kid doesn't feel like, you know, he may feel like he doesn't belong or what have you. And if, 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 if programs and schools started isolating or minimizing their participation, then, you know, that could lead to other problems and to those kids getting involved into other things other than what they are, are, are inspired or inspired to do. So I think they have a, a great responsibility in, in uh, creating those opportunities for kids. Are there any school sports models, schools that um, you've come across, Tatiana, uh, that strike you as exemplary? You've, you know, you, you, wow, you guys have really figured out some amazing things here. I, I can personally say when the lawsuit happened at my high school, Athleton, that when my sister entered in high school, it was all perfect. Like it was, it was great. She didn't have a problem. Kids didn't see her, student, high school students didn't see my sister Hannah as someone different. So that was a huge barrier within just my community. Again, when we talk about community, they became really supportive once they actually knew what was happening and what my race intern actually was and you know, what my disability is. And I, it was all coming together. And so when Hannah joined it, you know, the coaches were respectful for her. They said, Hannah, like, is there any way we can help with your workout? What do you want to work on? What's your goals? You know, what events do you want to do? So they started asking questions to her. Um, and so it, sometimes it just takes a little waking, you know, wake up call. To the best of your knowledge, how well are schools living up to the mandates, the federal mandates around providing, uh, you know, opportunities for students with disability? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think we, like I said before, the lawsuit, my lawsuit when it became federal was like a trampoline. So it set a ground and it prevented people from going any lower. I still believe that there needs to be education within coaches, right? Because coaches need to be um, more welcoming to students with disabilities. Because if you're not welcoming and you're not encouraged, then, you know, why, why would I want to continue to try out for that, that team, right? So if you're turned away, um, I think that we still need to educate coaches and um, about ad adaptations and about sports. And it's really not that hard to do, but it's, it, it's about breaking that misconception again. Um, it's just that people need to be educated. Um, people maybe need to be encouraged to be, you know, educated and again, breaking that barrier. And, um, you know, it's about being respectful that adaptive sports are real sports. <laughs> and my racing chair is like, you know, a baseball glove. It's like a pair of running shoes. And uh, so, yeah, I, I still think that we've come a long way, but we still have further to go. Um, when we talk about, you know, full inclusion and we want to make it bigger and, um, and really encourage more and more students to, you know, to, to try out. Um, but they have to be welcomed as well. You know, there are different types of disability, obviously. There's physical disability, there's intellectual disability, there are right. uh, other forms as well. Is that possibly an opportunity? Is like maybe within the school environment for, you know, the parents of kids who have whatever form of disability to develop a collective voice and talk to the school about, you know, this is more than just one or two kids out here you have an obligation to really think about the needs of all students. 
Um, I, I, yes, definitely. Um, I, I think parents are so powerful and I'm so lucky for uh, my parents because again, they were that voice to that school. So I think parents can come collectively and, and say, this is, this is the facts. This is what is, is happening and present that to the school because you want solutions, right? And that's what we're trying to do right now. Having what's so what's the best solution? You know, how can we have these students with a disability participate in high school sports? So whatever it might be, you know, if it's volleyball, that's easy. They don't, you don't need, you know, extra equipment, you know? Um, and, you know, maybe if it's a basketball chair, they can go to new motion and get a, basketball chair that's at low cost. Um, maybe they can apply for grants at CAF. Um, so there, there are ways. Um, I think power of a group is really important <laughs> um, because I, my power of a group was my mom and I, um, my family, and and our wonderful, obviously our wonderful Lord who believed in all this. So um, I think it's more of a community base will do a lot better. Uh, I want to ask you about what type of sports system you believe we should be aiming to build for children in this country. Let's look out to the year 2028, right? The year of the LA Olympics and Paralympics. What type of sports system do you think we collectively can and should build by then? My dream would be one day, <laughs> magically wake up, um, you know, is one not seeing as a person with a, with a disability so different, right? And I think that having a Paralympic Games in LA 28 is going to be our saving grace because that is our goal point. We want to make sure that, you know, the in inclusion is definitely happening by then. And if we want to recruit more Paralympic athletes in the future, we have to start today. We have to start in our communities. We have to start in our school systems. We have to, it, it is grabbing those 10 year olds. It is grabbing, you know, those 15 year olds maybe. It, it's now, we we really need to focus on the youth now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... The, what you know this this incredible film rising phoenix which i saw the other night is so inspiring it's the it's the, the best of the human spirit thank you for helping uh get that out the door what do you hope it achieves so the the rising phoenix tells about the history of the paralympics but what it also does is breaks barriers in talking about disability and when we were talking about when we were gonna have this film coming out, we decided this is the perfect year to have it. Um, during, during this time, um, people are thirsty for sports, they're, you know, to watch something um, in the afternoon, but it's also the perfect time to educate people and to educate about Paralympics and about disability and the inequalities that are happening you know, globally. It's not just the United States, it's, it's everywhere. And it's, um, I felt really empowered after I watched this film. I really wanted to go to compete at the Paralympics the next day. So I just hope that, you know, with anyone that watches this film that has a disability or not, that they can feel empowered to become something, that they can feel empowered on achieving their goals. So and the last question for me is, um, so COVID-19 is obviously shut down many sports, uh, made kids inactive. How do we keep kids interested and physically active um, so this time off doesn't cause them to permanently retire, and especially kids who have disabilities? Virtual meetings, virtual meetups on weekends. So I did a virtual meetup on, um, for the NYRR program, and they meet every Saturday. So I think having one or two days where they can virtually meet up go over exercises, have maybe an Olympic athlete or a Paralympic athlete there um, to going through exercises and, um, you know, talking about 
you know, the importance of sleep and the importance of, you know, um, a proper diet and training and what they can do to stay active during this time of COVID because it is different uh, and giving tips on, you know, how to deal with, you know, the uncertainty because that's hard for a lot of people and it's really hard for the, the youth as well. It's hard for kids. Um, so I think virtual, um, it's almost like having like a little like camp. <laughs> it's, it's so important and the kids love it. Um, so I think that's something that should be added more uh, routinely. Had, um, we also wanted to ask our guests about another major theme in society today, addressing racial injustice. We asked for any advice they have for students on how they can use their voice to drive progress. And what advice do you have for young athletes, you know, high school age or, or under, who may want to use their voice to address racial inequities? Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. I think that that means that they want this world to be a better place. And so I would encourage them to use their voice. Use, and I think when we talk about, you know, using our voice, you know, sometimes um, young athletes might feel like they need to have a platform or a following, but we all have a following in our own lives. And I think it looks like our families and it looks like our friends. And so I think um, having some of those conversations and finding small ways to, to bring that to action as well. Um, is a great start for a young athlete. Ooh, I think starting the conversation is so important. And especially with this year in 2020, we've been able to do that, especially through social media and making sure that, you know, you are old enough to use social media and kind of aware of the things that can happen because social media is a wonderful place, but it can also be a scary place and making sure that, um, with social media being kind of like the new newspaper, we're also educating our kids on, on social media safety because that's it's something that is almost inevitable at this point, which is crazy. Um, but using your platform and, and speaking to those around you, if you see something that's wrong, encouraging kids to speak up and also us ourselves as adults, making sure that if we see something that we're calling it out and we're making sure people know, hey, this isn't right. So starting that conversation, I think is a wonderful place to start. It's really important that you fight for change. You keep your standards high. I think for a long time, it will seem uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, you shouldn't feel alone. This fight isn't just for, um, you know, uh, the black community. It's, it's not a fight that you should feel like you're fighting by yourself. Um, like I said, I had a very healthy relationship with my teammates growing up. And I think that the more you can have these open conversations with people, the better. And you wanna pull everyone into the fight. You don't wanna feel like it's you versus the world. So I think the more you can have open and honest conversations about um, change and how you wanna inflict change on the world, I think the better and you'll have support and support is super important in order to make change. Um, but any, any uh athlete that's out there that's thinking about using their voice to advocate uh, against racial injustice, I would just say, you know, use it. You have a voice, you have a platform. Um, just find out issues uh, that are going on. Find out areas that you care about and that you're passionate about. Um, become educated in it and, and, and use your, your voice. Use your platform on social media. Uh, you know, educate your peers, educate your family members. And, 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 and don't be afraid, have, have boldness, have courage. Um, there's no time like, like, like now, um, you know, you've been given a gift, you've been given a platform, you've been given the resources, use them to make the world a better place. Don't just think about yourself, think about others and making this world a better place for them. What advice do you have to young athletes, high school age or under, who may want to use their voice to address racial inequities? Um, I think just be educated, be truthful, um, be truthful to number one, who you are. And um, really, you know, like I said, this is a, a serious issue. This is a serious time in our country. Um, you know, myself, I've used my voice, my platform um, uh, to be at the forefront of what's going on in America. Um, and it's something that, 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 that needs to be addressed. And so it's something that, again, like I said, as a black American, um, as a black race, Black community, we've, we've been experiencing it for some time now. 
And so again, especially you find yourself uh, someone of statue, uh, stature or what have you, um, a celebrity or somebody with a name, then obviously your voice can go a long way. Um, but even if it isn't, um, but obviously just standing in your truth and, and, you know, educating yourself about, you know, really kind of what's going on and, you know, again, making it known that this is what I'm, I'm standing up for and kind of just standing in the gap for um, a lot of people that, that, that like myself and others uh, to come um, that are going to be experiencing some of these, uh, these, these, these racial uh, inequalities and injustices. You still have a voice and your words and, and, and what you believe in and, and your support of right and wrong still matter. It might not be on the platform that we as athletes are on, but you can go outside in your community and still make a difference because it, it's the trickle down effect. Each one teach one. And as you teach and you learn and you have that conversation, things get better. You get it out on the table and hopefully, like, like Adam said, you change people's views. You bring some people off of that other aisle onto the same common goal, into the same common goal. And hopefully we all can make change together. Use that voice. <laughs> Your voice is, is so powerful. Um, and it's, use it, you know, you're using it for the good. And it's so important to make the difference for the next person. I think it's okay to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I think that's so important to learn because I was so uncomfortable going through the lawsuit. It was, it was so hard. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and so, but you have to be okay with that because you know, the bigger picture, you know, the bigger picture of we need to have more equality. You know, we, we have to fight this. Um, and, especially the, the racial injustice, because, you know, having, having that voice and changing your community, it, it starts in your community. And then it just, it has a domino effect to, to the rest of the world. So um, use it. It's important. <laughs> you will go places. <laughs> As today comes to a close, I want to thank all of our speakers, not only for their presentations, but also for their commitment, along with thousands of other school-based educators across the country who have been ensuring students have opportunities to stay active, whether they're experiencing school virtually, in a hybrid model, or in person. For those of you joining us for this afternoon's workshops, we will be joined by the winners and finalists from the Great Middle School Sports Search for our middle school workshop, and are pleased to partner with A Long Talk for our session on discussing race and team settings. Of course, there's lots of great content in our event app, as well as on the Project Play website too. And we hope to see you here tomorrow at 11 a.m. as we begin the third day of the Project Play Summit that promises more incredible speakers, exciting announcements, and a focus on opportunities for coaches.